There are certain businesses that need to prove the integrity and timestamp of information. These are businesses like a healthcare company who's collecting data for a clinical trial or for uh, um, uh, an audit firm who is creating an audit trail for data that's collected from uh, a client. And so at Tyrion, what we're doing is we're using the blockchain. Sorry. Wow, you really have to talk into this mic. I'm swallowing this mic today, guys. Um, all right, so what we're doing is we're using a technology to build a global proof engine. And I'm going to talk about that. But first, I'd like to introduce you guys to Blockchain Jesus. That's not right. That's Bitcoin Jesus. He's a friend. There's a difference. So how many people here are software developers? Two hands. Hey, Brian. Uh, three hands. OK. All right, I'm going to change this talk a little bit based on what I've heard from people this morning and the fact that there aren't a lot of developers in the room. Um, based on what I've heard this morning from uh, Jeffrey Tucker and some of the other folks, Y'all need Jesus. Y'all need <laughs> blockchain Jesus. Because there's been this popular idea for the past, I don't know, it really kind of started in like 2012, I'm sorry, 2015. Uh, we're just going to put everything on the blockchain. The blockchain is a general purpose computing platform, a database immutable storage layer in the sky. And that's just not true. There are, um, uh, it, it, that's, a, that's a big misnomer. And so, <clears throat> So you have to ask yourself the question, why can't we put everything on the blockchain? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one is that, uh, so for example, a Bitcoin network can only handle about three transactions per second, three, four. And the cost of each transaction is, I don't know, it's probably about 15 bucks today, $10 today. It's a lot of money. And so you can't just put information into a Bitcoin network because it can only handle three transactions per second. Everybody would be competing for the same space. And also, it costs a ton of money. If you take a look at something like Ethereum, you have a, a platform where it's not intended just for value uh, exchange, which is primarily what Bitcoin is intended for. Uh, Ethereum is built to be a general purpose computing platform based on something called smart contracts, which I like to refer to as stored procedures in a log file. Um, but the, with Ethereum, you can only do about 10, 15 transactions per second. And uh, the, each co the cost of a transaction on Ethereum right now is about 25 cents, I believe. I don't know, things are, are changing rapidly, but there's a, there's a cost issue there. And I, I remember back in um, 2016, I was one of the judges at a, at a hackathon. And one of the people at the hackathon built an entry for um, doing voting on the blockchain. This was in, uh, in New York City. And I just took out my phone, and I did some, some quick math, and at the time, I asked them, is this on the public Ethereum blockchain or on a, on a private blockchain? And they're like, the public blockchain. And I said, well, you know, it's interesting that you want to be able to put votes in the blockchain to make them immutable but, and be able to have a public record of when votes are being recorded. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe that's not a bad idea, but that was their idea. Um, but the interesting thing was that uh, I just did some quick math. And at the time, uh, we were in New York. I said, let's assume that we were going to have 5 million people in New York vote. And I did the math on my phone, and it turned out that it would tie up to just you run this application and record those votes would tie up the entire Ethereum blockchain for seven and a half months, and that the transaction fee at the time would have cost sixty thousand dollars, of which now it's an, uh, transaction fees are, are an order of magnitude greater. So, you know, all these ideas we're going to put the supply chain on the blockchain, we're going to put the voting on the blockchain, we're going to put everything on the blockchain. It's not feasible, and it's 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 a myth and that people need to stop saying. There are plenty of other problems that are out there called blockchains where you have private blockchains, which is really just like an application server with an append-only data structure on the back end. Append-only meaning that uh, you can only add to it, and once you've added something, you can't change what had, uh, what had been entered uh, previously. So, so instead of putting things on the blockchain, what you can do at scale is link things to the blockchain. And that's what we've created with at Tyrion. So we've created a technology called Chainpoint that allows you to link data from off the blockchain to a transaction on the blockchain and create what's called a Chainpoint proof that allows you to verify the integrity and timestamp of uh, that information uh, on the blockchain. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go back to about 2015 when we, first, uh, when we first started doing this. At the time, there was a few services on the internet. Actually, I have a spreadsheet of 38 different things, services called proof of existence services, where you were able to um, 
uh, use the blockchain as, quote unquote, a digital notary. Um, uh, Jeffrey Tucker talked earlier this morning about people getting married on the blockchain. They didn't actually go like on the blockchain or their marriage certificate isn't on the blockchain. What they did is, in that case, uh, they, they recorded a small amount of information in a Bitcoin transaction. There's a field inside Bitcoin called op return that allows you to store 80 bytes worth of data. So that's a, a very small amount of text. It's, it's, a, it's, well, it used to be about half a tweet. Now it's about like a sixth of a tweet or a fifth of a tweet worth of information. So <clears throat> there were services that would allow you to record a little bit of information into the blockchain. I could be like, you know, I love my wife, Carolyn. I put it in the blockchain. I say, hey, honey, look, I love you. It's in the blockchain, um, which is, you know, makes her happy or roll her eyes at me. But, uh, 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 but it's not very useful uh, when you consider the fact that uh, you can only have three or five, three to five transactions per second in Bitcoin uh, currently. Um, well, I'm sorry, at that time, now it's a little bit more with SegWit. But there are a few services that allow you to do this. You could either record information or you could publish a hash of information into a transaction on the blockchain. But what, you had to pay like a fee. So what you might do is you go to a website like proofofexistence.com and you would drag and drop a file onto the screen. Let's say it's a PDF file, a contract between the two of us for uh, you know, some service. You could, uh, we could drag and drop that onto the screen, and you would be able, it would generate a hash, which is a digital fingerprint. It's a 32-byte number based on the content of that, in, of that document. And then you would have to, it would give you a specific Bitcoin address, and you would have to pay money to that Bitcoin address. So back then it was about three to five cents. Now it's about you know, 10 to $15. So there wasn't a way for this to, uh, to, to scale. And so this was a real problem. But data integrity, time stamping, um, uh, identity systems, all, all the infrastructure for the internet um, uses uh, uh, certain systems as a root of trust for being able to verify that things haven't changed. So that the SSL certificate was that you're using at the shopping cart website was actually issued by a company. So, a lot of people saw promise in replacing or, or supplanting that um, existing infrastructure with a new infrastructure based on uh, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology. But the technology for it to, to work at scale didn't exist. So we created something uh, called uh, Tyrion. And what Tyrion was, was a software as a service application that you could use, that you could send it information and it would automatically create a, a proof, a, what, what we call a chain point proof. It would hash that information and it would link all that information to a single transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so I'll explain a little bit more, little bit more about this later, but what we were able to do is take in thousands, millions, even billions of records and link those to an individual Bitcoin transaction. So we could do this at scale now. We had customers who were doing things, uh, uh, you know, um, 100,000 records a month was a, an early customer. It was, and that would have cost them a fortune and it would have never been able to be possible before with just uh, anchoring things into Bitcoin. <clears throat> so, let me skip past this. So what we've done after that, so that was in 2015. And we saw a lot of interesting use cases uh, for the technology. Um, things from uh, adding time stamp, uh, trustless time stamping to digital signature uh, applications like HelloSign and DocuSign. Uh, those aren't uh, actual customers, but some of their smaller competitors are, are using our platform. Um, creating an audit trail for uh, people who are collecting documents for accounting purposes. So if you, uh, if you hire a company like uh, Deloitte or KPMG, they ask you to turn over a bunch of information related to your, your business, your financial records, business forecasts, things like that. They need to be able to have some assurance that the information that's collected is correct so that there's any other question that comes back after the audit is done, they can say, hey, look, this is the information that was supplied by our customer and it hasn't been changed or modified and now we have proof of that. So in a sense, uh, we're in the uh, proof business right now. And what we did is we took that software application that worked and provided that utility for customers and instead of just having it run through a single software uh, system, we decided to create a global distributed network. So we launched something called the Tyrion Network. We were able to take that technology and make it so that you could have a, a set of nodes, just like the Bitcoin network in, the, in a sense, around the world that all aggregated all of this information in and linked it to a single Bitcoin transaction that our system does uh, every few minutes. And so this brings a whole new level of scale and uh, capabilities to, uh, uh, to this type of technology. And interestingly, 
it, uh, it also improves the reliability of being having this service available to people, which is important. The, um, with, with our system, although we've never really had any significant downtime, we're the uh, single point of failure. If, if you don't pay your bill or, or uh, something happens with a cloud service provider somewhere along the way, the system has a potential of going down. With this network, we don't have those points of failure. It's much more redundant, it's global, and it's robust. And right now, there are about 5,000 nodes that are running around the world. So we've created this global proof network that we're, we're, we're launching. So um, I'm gonna, I'll go through this. So I want to explain a little bit about the technology, about uh, Chainpoint, about how we do what we do. So with Chainpoint, we've created this open standard that you can use to create a timestamp proof of any data, file, or business process. So the way that it works is if you have, uh, let's say you have a record in a database or you have a, a document or, or a million records in a database and you want to be able to, you want to be able to prove the existence of that information, that it hasn't been modified, and then if you have these uh, proofs that are chained together, you can prove that there's a, an ordered series of events that all occurred and hadn't been modified at a particular time. So what we do is from a software perspective, we create a hash of the information. Now, you guys, who knows what a hash is? All right, so about half the room. So for everybody else, a hash is often compared to something like a digital fingerprint. You can take any piece of information. It could be you know, the letter W, one character, or it could be a digital copy of the Lord of the Rings that's like 25 gigabytes. And you analyze it, and based on the unique, um, uh, uh, the, the unique structure of that whatever piece of data that is, you will produce an output that is just a single number there are many hashing functions. The one that's in, using Bitcoin is SHA-256. So you get a 32-byte number that comes out of it no matter what. So what we do is, is, is you take a, a hash or a whole series of hashes. So we're collecting hashes from customers. And there could be thousands or hundreds of thousands that are coming into the system at any given time. We take them and we do some magic stuff here, which I'll skip over. But we construct what's called a Merkle tree. And what you're doing is just, you, you, you've already hashed something to generate this set of hashes here that are all leaves of this tree. And then what you're doing is you're pairing them off and you're hashing them together and you get another hash, an intermediate hash. And then you take that pair and you do another intermediate hash. And you keep doing that or the computer keeps doing that until it gets to a single root. It's called the Merkle root. And then what we do with that Merkle root is that we publish a Bitcoin transaction. Let's keep it simple, Bitcoin transaction that embeds that Merkle root. And then for every item in this list, we create what's called a Merkle inclusion proof, which basically only means that we trace the path from here, back through here, back here and here, essentially for every single item that came in initially. So in this, op in this example, there are eight hashes that are going in. We have a Merkle tree with eight leaves. I think that's eight, can't really see too well. Uh, and then on the other side, we get uh, eight chain point proofs come out the back side. So what you're doing is you're generating, um, uh, you're using aggregation to link, to take in a huge amount of data and link it to a single transaction and then return uh, a proofs. So this is what a chain point proof looks like, sort of in an abstract sense. You start at the top with a hash, <coughs> excuse me, and um, that initial hash contains, this, this proof contains three timestamp elements. The initial part, it contains the NTP time from the local machine. Um, uh, NTP time is, is just a way for the local machine to, to test and say, this is what time I think it is when it submitted something. This, um, then you go through a series of operations, and you can see that there's a NIST randomness beacon that's added in here. So NIST is the National Institute of Standard and Technology. They have something called the randomness beacon, which, can, which broadcasts a random number um, that can be used for a variety of services. If you need entropy or if you need a timestamp, you can fold it into your, your system. So without going into the specifics, as we construct these proofs, um, we are doing uh, two unique things. One is that we're, we're, we're aggregating everything and we're anchoring it to a transaction in Bitcoin at the bottom. And then we're also folding in this other NIST randomness beacon proof, which allows us to do something where, where we're not only able to prove um, the, uh, uh, the, the timestamp of the elements of, of all the different anchor points inside here, but we're also able to prove that this proof was created within a specific time window, so relatively narrow. 
which is, which is uh, somewhat unique. And so just you know, for the, the technical folks, what we're doing here is we, we have a hash. We have a series of operations that are like a, just like a, your typical sort of like stack that, you're, um, that you run through. And you're able to get from this initial hash to the hash that is published uh, in a Bitcoin transaction. And you are able to, a uh, computer can go through this and they can verify that, that linkage. So it's a pointer to uh, a transaction in the blockchain, hence the name Chainpoint. And, and if you think about the web, the, the web um, uh, uh, is really just a bunch of linked pages. It is, uh, contrary to what Jeffrey Tucker says, it is not a copy machine. Um, <laughs> It, you know, the, the fundamental thing that's interesting about the web was a link. So you have a, a pointer from one page uh, to another page. And I think similarly, technology like this is going to change, maybe not at quite as big a scale, but change how things are done with data, how proof and verification of data is done by allowing you to have links or pointers from ex data in the existing world to a transaction on a global distributed network. So. Let me talk a little bit about um, uh, how this technology is used to kind of make it real uh, for everybody. So <clears throat> um, I'll tell you the story about how we launched Tyrion. It's, it's kind of funny. Uh, back in uh, 2015, in September of 2015, I went to New York. Uh, we, launched the, we launched Tyrion. We actually were trying to have a quiet launch. We thought that we were going to put the system live and that we were going to tell uh, you know, a couple colleagues and friends and they would use it and that we would work out some bugs and, and we would just move forward. Um, I ended up going to uh, a hackathon in New York for a, a trade show called Consensus. And Consensus has actually turned into the, the biggest uh, industry event for Bitcoin and blockchain. And I entered the hackathon and uh, we ended up winning. Uh, we made an insurance claims processing system that created a proof for both the claimant and the insurance company of the time uh, and the content of when a claim was submitted. And then we created an audit trail as that claim moved through multiple IT systems in the back end. So instead of having to um, uh, integrate all the systems together, you could now use the blockchain as a, as a proof, as an external independent proof of, of all that information. <laughs> and uh, then the traffic to the website started going up crazy. And people started signing up like mad. And one of the very first phone calls that I got uh, in the next month was from a gentleman who worked at Philips. Um, they had just started a blockchain lab. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things that I found is that the use cases that people are used Tyrion for are way, way different than anything that we could have predicted initially. And uh, so you know, I, I, we had this phone call. And uh, he explained that uh, he had built a prototype collecting data from MRI machines. And, I was, I was blown away. Uh, so Philips, I learned, that is the largest manufacturer of industrial medical equipment. It was about 40% of their business at the, at the time. And what he was doing was, was collecting data from these MRI machines to create an audit trail of its maintenance usage and calibration history. So it's pretty interesting. And over the next year after that, we went through uh, a series of uh, prototypes, things that we worked on for everything from uh, creating an audit trail for certain types of patient care to uh, different types of uh, usage of, of using this technology to verify uh, medical records and other types of data. And I think there's an important point to be made here is that um, hospitals have like these gigantic EHR systems, electronic health record systems. And these are very, very big purchases. Um, my wife used to work for a Hartford Hospital. Uh, they were rolling out one of the larger systems. It's called Epic. The, the rollout roadmap was 36 months. So no new technology is going to come along in the next 36 months and derail that from the Connecticut State Hospital System. It is just not something that is, 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 is going to happen. But there's an interesting opportunity to enhance the security to make sure that these medical records haven't been hacked or that this audit trail for this process for you know, charting for a nurse or reporting data into from a, a series of, of, of lab tests that come back has not been modified and was in their system at a particular point in time. And so there's a lot of companies who talk about putting healthcare on the blockchain. And I'm skeptical of, uh, of at least that path, having gone through this with many healthcare companies, uh, because they already have these existing systems. There's a huge legacy and a regulatory cost for them to switch from those ex existing systems to a new system. So having something that enhances one of their existing systems is probably, at this point in time, the only possibility. 
And uh, one of the hallmarks of, of Tyrion that's been uh, interesting to watch as well is that it, it's pretty easy to use. And so people can just go to the uh, Tyrion.com and they can sign up. And then a few minutes later, they have a good set of tools and an API for, uh, uh, for building these kinds of proofs. So we've had a lot of success with hackathons. Um, uh, actually, Michael Tidwell, who organized this entire event, that's where he and I met. Uh, we met at the Distributed Health Hackathon in um, Nashville, Tennessee. That's right. And so that was the first blockchain healthcare conference. And uh, we were blown away because 13 of the 18 teams in the hackathon used Tyrion, and every single uh, winning team used Tyrion. So it was a great example showing how ease of use and practical application of this technology was applicable towards a variety of business problems. And some of the entries they had there, I think Michael's entry was something for a company called Verifarm, where uh, they were creating an audit trail for the provenance of, um, I think it was tracking drugs as they were being shipped, which is interesting because we actually have a large pharmaceutical company that makes protein-based drugs. And these protein-based drugs have to uh, be kept within a certain temperature range while they're shipped, otherwise they lose their efficiency. And so Tyrion is used to collect data from the sensors that are being used to ship uh, to the sensors on the uh, packaging that's being used to ship those drugs, and then be able to create a provable audit trail of all that information as it goes through um, uh, the shipping process. So again, with what we're doing, there, the, the key thing here is that we have technology that's in practical use today. Thousands of customers are using Tyrion. There is an extremely high volume of scalable, you know, uh, we're demonstrating scalability by having an extremely high volume of traffic go through our system. And you're getting real value today. If you have any type of system where you want to be able to prove the integrity or timestamp of information, it could be a financial system, it could be an insurance system, it could be a healthcare system. We have to think that you can use uh, today. There's no need to rebuild your entire software stack on top of uh, a new blockchain system or train your developers on using something on the, on the Ethereum or the Hyperledger stack. You can, uh, you can do this today. Also, you stay in control of, uh, of your data. Many of the other systems that are out there, especially uh, public blockchains, um, one, of the, one of the things people don't usually realize at first is that your information is shared with everybody else. Now, it can be encrypted maybe with the keys that you control, but in general, if you put something onto a blockchain, it is shared with a whole bunch of other parties and they have, they have visibility to it. And so in this case, you can have information in the private cloud infrastructure that you already have today. And you can have this, this uh, interesting proof and verification uh, capability that gets added to it. So if you're a developer, both of you, um, next step, you can go to github.com slash chainpoint and download some of our, our newer technology and be able to uh, use the Chainpoint client to, uh, to build an application. Um, if you guys are interested, there's also the ability to download and run a Chainpoint node, which is like your own private version of Tyrion's backend that you can use to, to run your own scalable system to be able to create uh, and verify these proofs. So that's what I have today to talk about as far as uh, Tyrion goes. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Wayne Vaughn. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, so you discuss some of the use cases, but we hear a lot about the real estate in blockchain and all that. How is that something like this or something like that? Skeptical. It depends on what the word blockchain means to you. What's the question? So the question was, um, there are a lot of people who talk about putting real estate on the blockchain, other types of digital assets. And so how is that going to work? Can you use this technology? And the answer is no, not this technology. But I'm skeptical of that use case overall. Uh, here's why. Um, when you talk about assets, there's, you can separate them into two classes. Bearer assets, like cash. If I have 20 bucks and I give you 20 bucks, you now have my 20 bucks and that's it. And there's registered assets, like the title of my car. So if I give you the title of my car, I still have my car, you just have a piece of paper. So when it comes to real estate on the blockchain or other registered assets, um, you, you can register them and you can create like a certificate of ownership. And I can have a digital signature where I sign over based my ownership uh, to you. But at the end of the day, like let's say that I sell you my car, but I have a big like you know I didn't pay my taxes or something like that. The government can come along and they can and they can and they will take the car even if you're the uh, the new owner and it has a lien against it. You just didn't know about that particular lien. So 
if you want to put registered assets onto a, a blockchain, um, with there, there's always going to be some counterparty risk because because uh, uh, that phys the physical asset may not actually um, may not actually have the same state that it had when it was registered. My home could, if I sell you my home, my home could burn down. Blockchain doesn't know about that, but the insurance company does, the fire department does. So there are all these other all these other factors. So the main reason that you want to have a blockchain is for censorship resistance and for um, uh, data integrity and, and, and immutability. So using a blockchain, using the term blockchain loosely, you could say that you can create a registry, an application that stores a registry of things. And it also stores a registry of, let's say, homes and people. And anybody who's a member of that registry in the people column, if you will, um, they would be able to uh, register their home and then digitally sign it over to somebody else who's in the registry. Well, that's not too different than what we have with uh, applications today, and there's no reason to have a blockchain there. You can securitize parts of your home or create an asset for your home and then trade it like a, like a token, um, but I still think there are lots of issues that are, need to get worked out around that. So I, we haven't figured out digital bearer assets. Digital registered assets are far more complicated, and I think that we need to figure one out before the other one gets figured out. And what's the, what's the central registration piece of the way? Then what's the way? But then, OK, so let's, let's say, for example, so the gentleman said, unless the central registered entities go away. So now I get back to the question, who pays for the blockchain? So I wrote a series of articles about this for Coindesk and some other places on the web. So right now, if you want to maintain a registry of land titles, let's say, you need to be able to pay for that. There's people who have to be able to um, put things into the system. You have to, in the case of, in a Bitcoin transaction or an Ethereum transaction, well, it's just Bitcoin because the examples are simpler. Everything is based on math and energy. You know, the, their miners input electricity into their miners. It generates a number that has certain properties, and that's how everything is provable. If, if I register a home in a, um, uh, uh, a land titling system, I may lie about its condition. Uh, it may burn to the ground. There are other factors that have to come in to verify the state of, of that system. The property assessment value may be incorrect. There, 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 there may be all sorts of things that happen like that. So the point is, is that there is, you have to have a registry of, of this, and somebody has to pay the hosting bill. Somebody has to maintain how, how all that happens. You can't, it is very difficult, and I'm very skeptical of the idea that you can take that and you can break it up into a decentralized asset, and you can have other people efficiently run that as, uh, and, and maintain consensus between all of those, in this case, land title registries uh, around the world. It may be possible someday, but I don't think it's possible with today's technology, although some of my friends and other people are, are working on similar things. It's just of my view of having done this you know, for a very long time, uh, at least in this world, uh, uh, makes me very skeptical of it. I agree with you about today. Sure. I've met lots of guys who disagree tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Consensus, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the, the assumption is that the tax authority in this case goes away if it's adopted. Registration will go to the taxing authority in the municipality adopts the blockchain places the registered asset um, on the blockchain, which they register authority as Vermont. Vermont City Pilots blockchain real estate. So if you have a signature uh, when you change registration from the taxing authority to say this is a clean title, there are no means that we have registered with us, so we stamp that the transaction is valid, then everything transfers to you have the taxing authority, the government regulator that says this is a closure transaction. So it, it would presuppose that the taxing authority, the government, the regulator, adopting the technology that is. That's no different than what we have today. In a sense, imagine every municipality maintained uh, had, a, had an information standard for registering titles, and they each maintained an application server in the cloud somewhere. Somebody could do it in AWS, and somebody else could do it in Google Compute or whatever you want, and they can run these registries. 
And now everybody knows that there is some, uh, let's say like a DNS server that knows where all these registries are. So that's a central sort of point of failure or for, for that particular system because people have to know if my LAN title is in, in, in our theoretical example, is in Atlanta, you know, and I'm from Mountain View, California, if I wanted to buy your home, I need to be able to find it in the registry and look it up. Alternatively, you have to be able to replicate every land title from every piece of property everywhere throughout the entire network, which is kind of how, which is exactly how Bitcoin works. Every single node on the Bitcoin network has a copy of every single transaction that has ever occurred in the entire history of, of, of Bitcoin. So there's tremendous inefficiencies there. So if you had a system where people were putting things, uh, having a standard for being able to represent a land title, if there was a standard registry of identities for citizens, and you were able to use uh, some agreed upon digital signature technology to be able to sign those titles, um, you could build something that is like what you're saying, but it's not a blockchain and doesn't need one. So it's not to say that that's a fancy database. It's not a fancy database. It's, it's, it's a distributed system you know, that has a standard relational probably database behind it. Um, but the idea that like, I have a, uh, an application in my wallet and it, maybe it's got a, a private key that's associated with that and I can digitally sign and transfer that clean land title for me uh, uh, to you. And then you don't really have the, um, you don't have the need for these registries for, at, the, at the town level. I think is interesting, but then you get back to the situation of like, well, what happens if I lose my phone? Or now I'm just backing my data up to my cloud provider. So again, there's a lot of experimentation going on with this type of stuff, but it's not entirely clear that there is any efficiency that is being um, uh, uh, created. Nobody is, is, is selling these types of assets at scale. There are definitely securities that are coming on the blockchain, like actual securities. You know, Overstock has their T0 project. There's a, there's a couple others that are, that are coming through. Just one second. Lady over here. Yeah, um, you know, you talked about how with the, one of the hackathon situations you had, you kind of integrated um, disparate systems, you know, in that insurance example. So could Ethereum not help to fix some of these systems that are all over the place and they can talk to each other and prove, you know, the chain and the asset? In, in that case, what was happening is those different systems were reporting to another application layer. So it wasn't, they weren't, we weren't doing anything to tie the information together um, from like the sense that, so let's say that, let's, let's take the example. So we were talking in that case about insurance claims. So if you have an insurance claims processing process inside a large company, uh, that involves multiple systems. You have a system where the claim is filed. You might have another like um, uh, telecom system where somebody calls you up on the phone and says, oh, I'm sorry to hear you have this claim. I need to collect some information from you. Sometimes that's not even from the same company. It's from like an outsourced vendor and you want to be able to swap the vendors. The, the insurance company wants to be able to have competitive bids for the vendors. So there's a disincentive for them to be able to actually integrate all these systems because that, that process continues on. So what we did in the hackathon was show how, hey, look, if you're an insurance company and you want to be able to have a way for creating this audit trail that you can track, um, there's a way to do it by having them all report a little piece of information into this system and to be able to, to, to create that audit trail. Um, the idea that blockchain is a magical database or technology that allows you to uh, connect different systems and eliminate data silos, I think is another misnomer that, you know, we've kind of gone through these cycles and we're in the middle of another one of them. Another one of them. Yeah, sir, you back there. Thanks for coming to talk about this. Uh, so I see like a lot of really interesting use cases for like companies that have to deal with regulatory compliance and stuff like that, um, and insurance. And this might be not for these types of industries, but would, would, do you have any examples for like how a small or a medium-sized business could benefit from something like this? Um, yeah, an interesting one too. Um, there are a lot of small companies selling marijuana nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, going back to what I said about being surprised about, about what people do with our, our technology, um, there's a few customers who create software that allows marijuana dispensaries to manage their inventory and cash transactions. And they have to be able to prove to the bank or whoever else, or, or maybe nobody at all right now, but they, they, they just know that I need to keep really good records because someday, I might get that phone call or, 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 or get that letter. So the people who are making essentially like QuickBooks for the pot industry, um, 
are, are, are using our technology to be able to create that sort of proof and that sort of audit trail. Uh, you're right in the sense that this makes the most sense for um, uh, the most business sense right now for large and regulated uh, industries. Um, but you can find other small examples. There are people who use our service to create a proof of, let's say, like some sort of like engineering diagram or idea before they submit it to a client. So that way that they can prove that, hey, I had this before I emailed it off to a customer so that they can't take it and have like their internal software developers uh, use this. It, 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 exactly. Um, there are a few, let me think of some other examples. It's, it, one thing that's a little bit frustrating for me is that most of our large customers, I just can't talk about what we're doing with them. Um, that's changing, thank, thankfully. So um, there are people who make inspection applications. So like inspecting things like uh, power plant equipment, construction site equipment, uh, aircraft inspections. Um, they use us to create a proof that an inspection happened at a particular period of time and that the information in that inspection hasn't been modified. And sometimes that data is reported directly from sensors or, or from like the equipment. Sometimes it's recorded by humans. And humans can lie. So you can, like, I like to say, you can notarize your lies. Um, but at least if you, you know, if you inspect a piece of aircraft and you say that you know, this, this reading was X and it wasn't and something bad happens, at least you now have proof that that was recorded and that you didn't change it afterwards. So in that case, uh, it is still useful. I just want to comment here. I actually used Tyrion to uh, get a PDF of some pictures. Some work that was done at my house by a contractor who was fired. And the worst way forward with a different contractor. So I, I, I did a Tyrion. I actually took the pictures, stayed in the project, at the point where we fired the director. My question was about Tyrion. Did you talk about the amount of the right Tyrion method? Sure. So right now, there is a network of about 5,000 Tyrion nodes that are running around the world. And there are also people who are running nodes that are not part of that network. And those people uh, run what we can call internally private nodes. And those are typically large companies that uh, are, uh, most of them just doing proofs of concept right now with uh, our new technology. Um, so some of them are existing customers who use our other system, but are, are, they're using this new technology. So, Tyrion has a uh, token. You can imagine that we spend money on Bitcoin uh, a lot. It's, uh, Bitcoin transactions have gone as high as $41 in the past uh, uh, two or three months. And so there's a lot of money to spend to conduct these, these anchoring transactions. So people who are running private nodes, they have Tyrion as part of that, that uh, a wallet associated with that, and they're spending to be able to submit data from that node up to core. So they can send a very large number of, of, of hashes into that node and then just periodically send uh, one thing into core. Now, the other people who are running as part of this public network, the token acts as an economic incentive for them to be able to run those nodes. So our system, this gets a little technical, I was going to try to keep it non-technical, but our system creates an intermediate blockchain called a calendar. And that ha and the calendar is, uh, no matter how many proofs get generated, that calendar is, remains relatively small over time. It's a fixed amount. And that calendar is shared by all of the nodes that are inside the network. What the network does is it audits those nodes, and then periodically one of those nodes uh, who passes that audit gets a reward of the native token for the Tyrion network, TNT. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, uh, the economic model for the system. Any use case for tax open up the system? Would there ever be something that would like take all of those transactions and take that one back? Just send that one to Well, it's a great question. Um, so, you can. There are some people who are making tools that will monitor your addresses and they will track all your transactions. So in this particular case, your crypto transactions, let's just use Bitcoin to make it simple, all of your Bitcoin transactions, they're already on the blockchain. So, any, so you can monitor an address and you can be able to see all the transactions in and out of that address. However, um, it's an interesting point where, where uh, some of the accounting firms uh, who are dealing with crypto uh, have been using us to collect data from clients. So not only so they want to have proof of all the transactions, but they want to have proof from the customer about, let's say it's a Bitcoin ATM machine. 
They want to have at least proof that the client said this Bitcoin ATM machine was located in this location at this period of time because that has to do about like what state tax was due from that, that BTM machine. Um, or there are other people who are collecting in and outside of the crypto space who are collecting data from, uh, from their clients in the accounting space. So the typical process that you go through when you hire a new uh, corporate accountant is they're going to ask you, they're going to give you an application. A uh, popular application is called Suralink. Suralink um, gives you a, a gigantic list of all the things that, that that accounting firm needs from you for the onboarding process and then subsequently the audit process. And it's just like a checklist. And it says, we need these kind of records. We need these kind of financial forecasts. We need a copy of the articles of incorporation. We need all this information. And there's a, count, there's a risk to the audit firm or the accounting firm that um, uh, you, that their clients claim, I didn't supply you with that information. I told you something else, that there's some sort of like problem downstream. So in this case, the accounting firm or the audit firm, they want proof, hey, this customer gave me this document at this time and I haven't modified it afterwards. And so there are companies that are integrating our, te our um, uh, technology into their, it's kind of like a workflow management checklist software that allows you to, to do that kind of stuff. So for stuff that's already on the blockchain, that is a you know, public immutable record. But for all the transactional data around that, or all the data around that transactional set of data, um, it can't be useful. I was uh, part of the charity administration for Nodes this week. And uh, one thing I noticed, I'm sure you did, is that there's really an overwhelming demand to, uh, to participate in like, a lot of Nodes. Is that, I'm just, you know, on a personal level, does that surprise you, or like, you know, and what are your plans for the rest of the year? You know, as far as like those are concerned. Sure. So definitely, the demand of Runeterian nodes surprised us in the beginning. Um, there was uh, we got over ten thousand nodes running up on the system within, I think it was like thirty six hours. So that was that was very surprising. Um, as far as the node registration process and what we have right now, um, we are changing that. Uh, uh, as we've announced on all of our blog posts, that we, we have a, a design change that we're going to be making to how that registration process works. And it will make it so that you do not have to, we will no longer have these registration events. But that will be coming at some point in time, you know, uh, later this year, but we're not ready to talk, you know, about things that are happening in the future. I'm happy to talk about anything that's happened in the past, but not going to give people guidance about, like, what we're doing on a uh, going forward basis. So uh, a few moments ago, you talked about a use case uh, where there was a medicine that uh, would have to stay at a certain temperature throughout its life cycle. Um, it, it, just to be clear, so Ethereum doesn't actually have anything to, it doesn't impact the, the recording of that data in terms of the, you know, sort of the last mile, the, the actual gathering of that data. It, it's all in the, um, it, it's all in the sort of the keeping of the records as opposed to having anything to do with the actual interaction with the, the medicine itself. Exactly. So in this case, um, there is a sensor that is um, attached to a refrigerating unit that is monitoring the data that is coming out of that refrigerating unit. And so what you want to be, what the customer wants to be able to do is, is one, know if it failed. And so, and, and these kind of things are, they're being shipped. It's not like you always have a a Wi-Fi connection or, or even shortwave radio isn't, isn't efficient for, for doing this kind of thing. So they want to have something that just says that this information was recorded at this time and it hasn't been tampered with afterwards. And that's, that's the key thing in this case. So with the example that we're talking about, um, the sensor itself and the software associated with it is responsible for collecting the data, computing the hash of that, and then sending that hash into our system and then what it's doing, uh, if I remember correctly, it's creating its own log file internally, which is a hash-linked list of all of that information that had been collected, and it's periodically um, anchoring that externally to the Bitcoin blockchain using our system. So it's so, periodic, it's not um, continuous? It could be, but just for the sake of efficiency, uh, it's, it's not. But they could do it with every single record if they wanted to. Is the, uh, there's a number of limits to the uh, hash um, there, from practical purposes, yeah, I mean, it can scale up really high. But uh, there's a there's a couple there's a couple constraints that you might want to think about. So number one is that when you send a hash into our system, just a single hash, that's 32 bytes of data. 
the proof that you get back could be like one point, or it could be 1,600 or 2,400 bytes, usually somewhere in that range. So there is, uh, at scale, one of the things that we have to look out for is that there's a little bit of data in and a whole lot of data coming out. And so we have to be uh, cognizant of that. Uh, the other thing is that um, with the proofs that we generate, the, the bigger the size of the Merkle tree, the larger the size of the proof. So for example, part of the, um, uh, part of each chain point proof, let me go back so I have this diagram. Part of each chain point proof actually contains a Bitcoin transaction and then uh, would contain, for, for, so every, every block on the Bitcoin blockchain contains a bunch of transactions. Let's say it's about 1,500 transactions on average right now. That, was, that number was right a couple months ago, but it's probably still close to being right today. And so the way that Bitcoin works is it, can, it creates a Merkle tree of all those transactions. And that tr Merkle tree is the number that shows up in the Bitcoin block header. And so the Merkle root that's in a Bitcoin block header is, is in, a, in a way, how these blocks in Bitcoin are uh, linked together. So the more transactions that go into Bitcoin, the bigger that segment of a, of a proof would go, could get. The more people that come in on the front end, if the, one, if the throughput going into the system, the velocity is very high, the size of the proofs would get uh, larger as well. Um, but from a practical storage of that, is that a problem? It's, it's not, and here's why. Um, so remember I said before it's about 1,600 to 2,400 bytes, you know, depending on the, the velocity now. Um, the way that a Merkle tree works and the way that it scales, it goes on a, on a log logarithmic scale. So if you have, uh, um, let's say, levels of a Merkle tree that gets to about 16,000 proofs, when you add one more level, you're getting to roughly 32,000 um, elements in that Merkle tree. You add one more level, you're getting to uh, 120, or, uh, 32, 64, 128, 256. You know, it scales that way. So um, it, is, it is a constraint, but uh, it is not as big a constraint as the, the IO section. Uh, there are other companies, there's a company called GuardTime who created some technology called uh, KSI, Key of the Signature Infrastructure. Um, they actually limit the size of the Merkle trees throughout their entire aggregation infrastructure. Uh, we don't currently do that right now, but if we got to the point where we thought we needed to, uh, we would, and that would just change how we queue information coming into the system. But scalability is not infinite, but technically it's probably as close to infinite as you could get. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks everybody for having me out here, appreciate it.